Hello and welcome back to a brand new episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. I hope that you're doing well and thank you for being here as always. Yes, you listening to this show right now, whether it be on your favourite audio podcasting platform or on the DNF1 YouTube channel. We're really grateful that you have chosen to tune into the show and join us for a bit of F1 chat and discussion. As always, we are joined on the episode by the DNF1 panel. This evening, we are joined by Lee Wallington. Lee, how are you, mate? You good? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, yourself? We don't ask you that very often. Uh. <laughs> yeah, all things considered, um, it's that time of the week, really, where I'm a bit optimistic about the prospects for the weekend. It's usually Sunday when it's all said and done and Ferrari put in their usual shambles of a performance for the weekend in where my mood tends to drip a little bit. But uh, otherwise, can't complain, to be honest. Things are on the up. It's Wednesday evening, so uh, yeah, this is when I peak during the week. Well, you have to be uh, optimistic for the preview, otherwise we would be very boring, won't we? Absolutely, yeah. We've got to <laughs> try and convince the followers and the listeners to... Uh, engage with us and get excited for the weekend with us and then of course depending on who they support it's either going to go really well or really bad right now but uh, I'm seeing a lot more happy McLaren fans on the timeline so that's always a very wholesome thing I like that um, actually a little bit envious because I, I, funny story I, when I went to Silverstone I was looking at all the merch going around there were loads of stands for McLaren in particular Lando Norris because he sells massive amounts I think he even outsells Hamilton in that regard it's incredible stuff and I must admit I would never dare buy another team's colors because I'm one of those fans you know it's fine if you want to wear other colors it's fine but I'm one of those fans that I'll stick to my team I'll only wear my team's colors but I wouldn't mind having that McLaren merch if it wasn't for the fact I was an ardent Ferrari fan I would definitely want to have that merch it's really really good I must admit yeah well, I mean the uh... The Lee of uh, yesteryear would have uh, really enjoyed that when McLaren was winning titles, saying you uh, <laughs> would buy a Ferrari, a uh, oh, McLaren match, sorry. Yeah, definitely. But uh, yeah, any McLaren fans listening in, let us know. You know, do you like the merch? Would you like to see change? I, I think it's probably the best looking merch on the grid right now, to be honest. It's really, really good stuff. Anyway, of course, we've got the Belgian Grand Prix to preview. The final race of the F1, well, the first half of the F1 season before the summer break. And before we get stuck in, obviously, almost forgot to mention, quick apology to our YouTube followers. Uh, We weren't able to upload a video version of the podcast following the Hungarian Grand Prix review. Reason being is that when we recorded the podcast and the video footage, uh, there was a glitch on the system that we were using. So we've had to change the system because we uh, lost the video footage so we had to change the system that we're using hopefully the quality is better not just video but audio as well but let us know we'd love to hear back from you anyway off tangent stuff aside belgian grand prix final race before the summer break and as it stands right now red bull are currently in record breaking form 12 race wins in a row they've won every single race this season so far and the longer the season goes and the longer this winning streak goes the question will continue to be asked can red bull really win every race in a formula one season unprecedented stuff but i certainly wouldn't rule it out at this point in time and lee i think the first thing we need to discuss heading into this belgian grand prix a bit of a somber topic So, you know, bear with me, guys. I know this is not the nicest thing to talk about, but I think it's very, very important and very, very relevant. So cast your minds back a few weeks. For those of you that weren't aware, a young driver named Delano Van Hoft took part in a, was it a Formula 4 regional Alpine race at Spa in very treacherous conditions. A lot of people following the incident even before the incident had happened were questioning whether or not it was safe to go racing as it were they went racing and unfortunately for young Delano and for the motorsport world a horrible incident happened which took his life and it's it's always horrible to hear news about that stuff and of course you know as the world goes on and life goes on of course we can only look back and try to learn lessons and try to prevent these things from happening again However, there is a constant here and it has raised question and debate over whether or not 
the circuit in particular is still sufficient to be safe enough to have racing on it at this point in time. And this particular incident happened in the same area that we have seen other incidents like this in the past. Um, You know, memory takes me back to Antoine Hubert, the Formula 2 driver that passed away following a very similar incident, albeit the conditions were different, but it was in a similar area on the track at Eau Rouge and Radion. And the race organisers at Spa had made wholesale changes to, you know, widen the runoff area to try and make it safer. However, unfortunately, the same incident has occurred and the same result has happened. And I think even though the Belgian Grand Prix is currently on the F1 calendar for 2024 that we've seen, Lee, I feel like we have to ask the question right now. Is Spa despite the prestige and despite the history and the heritage and the fact that it's one of the most amazing circuits in the world, one of my favourites, if not my all-time favourite, is it still safe to host motor racing at such an elite level or even levels below that, with all respect? Um, I mean, I agree with you in the first instance that it's one of my favourite races as well. I'd love to watch it. Um, I think it's a brilliant track. Um so I do want to state that, but I do feel that in the modern motorsport in its current format, I don't think it's safe enough. Um, obviously, the it's not as accident prone as like Nordschleife was in its heyday. Obviously, Nordschleife before it stopped being on the Formula One calendar and other and motorsport. I'm sure they still have some sports around it, but I know they're using more of a test track now than a actual racing circuit it's just the amount of accidents they had was so regular they had to be stopped running it there until they obviously the modern day Nürburgring um and which obviously shortened the track but the I love the getting the cars through Eau Rouge and into Radion but the work needs to be further they need to obviously increase runoff massively on both sides of the circuit which obviously ruins part of the spectacle but health and safety and driver's life are important. So there needs to be more changes made. Um, or unfortunately, I know obviously the drivers race and they know it's a uh, a dangerous sport and there's a risk of life lost um, in any motorsport category and any racetrack. It's not specific just to one circuit. Obviously, silly incidents like Suzuka have occurred obviously with Jules Bianchi, which could have been avoided. But in this instance with erosion ready on that's a track specific design and that needs to be reviewed further um otherwise the track should be considered being dropped just for um because it's just too too constant and loss of life unfortunately yeah absolutely and yeah i think you make a good point you know we often we try to draw comparisons between some of these fatal incidents as much as difficult it is as it is to do I feel like, you know, these things have to be done to ins- to ensure that motorsport becomes as safe as it possibly can. You know, I don't think this should leave no stone unturned. And fortunately, to a large degree, that's what, kind of what they do in that regard. You know, they, they try their utmost to make sure it's as safe as possible. However, sometimes, you know, these things can happen. It is still a very dangerous sport. And I do understand that there has to be an acceptance that, There is always going to be an element of risk to this. Um, You know, you can go down your local kart track. They always highlight the severe risks of motorsport in any forms. It's not just exclusive to the elite levels. And, you know, the, the incident with Antoine Hubert couldn't have been better for racing. It was a warm, hot day, very dry track. You couldn't have asked for better racing conditions. And yet... The same outcome happened, unfortunately, with Delano, the, the the incident itself, the track conditions were treacherous from the footage and the images that we were seeing. With hindsight, they shouldn't have been even on the t- on the circuit. You know, I remember a, we, we've seen a few times the footage of Lando Norris do the rounds this week in qualifying a couple of years ago when it was incredibly wet and he crashed at Eau Rouge and Radion. It was a very dangerous incident there. Lucky for him, it was only qualifying. It wasn't a race situation where there were other cars trying to go through at the same time. And Sebastian Vettel, he was saying on the radio, you know, red flag, red flag. This is exactly what I was saying. It's stupid that they should have even gone out. Fortunately, he's okay. And despite those difficult conditions that we can compare to other incidents, the constant seems to be the location. 
you know, Oruj and Radion, one of the most famous uh, section of corners in the entire world of motorsport. And, you know, even though it has such high prestige and everybody loves it for what it is. And of course, I think the risk element or the danger element does play a part in that, not necessarily from a fatality um, perspective, but the fact that, you know, you've got to be perfect through there and it is dangerous, it is risky. There is an element of that that brings excitement. That being said, there have been instances in the past where they have tried to curb that, um, the nature of that particular section of corners with a chicane, uh, with some bollards to slow the cars down to try and navigate that to make it a bit safer you know so th there are things that they can do but it gets to a point Lee where perhaps because of how complex this section is to try and um, you know navigate through and, and and try to get around these things and to ensure safety do we get to a point with Belgium where in the modern day of elite level motorsport we just can't guarantee the safety of the drivers um, and even, you know, the person that operating at the circuit to a point where we say, maybe we should stop racing here. If they're not going to make a fundamental change, which may be unpopular, maybe we have to consider racing elsewhere. Yeah. Or it's the alternative um, of track redesign that you remove a region ready on from the circuit. Um, layout and shorten the track, which obviously is a very long track, and the rest of the track is still very fun to watch. And um, obviously, the as as far as I'm aware, I can't think of any loss of life in other parts of the track in recent memory. Um, so the rest of the track could still be worth saving as a an event. Um, you just have to use like Monza's example, where they see they got rid of the. Um, I'm sure you know the the actual name for the, the curve. Uh, at the end of the um, the circuit, obviously the banks corner. Obviously, you can fill in the name if it comes to you, Adam. Uh, but you know the the what I'm referring to. I'm actually just looking it up right now. Um, oh, thank you. Part of part of my lack <laughs> of wheel knowledge on this one. You have to forgive me, uh, guys, on this one. But uh, I'm, I'm just are. yeah. I know bad, <laughs> bad defosi. Uh, let's see. We, you carry on whilst I have yeah, a look okay. for it. Um, but um, yeah. But they, they cut the corner out because it was too dangerous. But the rest of the Monza circuit is still very enjoyable to watch. So maybe that's another alternative that as popular as that part of the circuit is, if it can't be improved in safety to guarantee, to obviously minimize the loss of life as best as possible. And that there's a track um, redesign is required to cut that circuit out if they want to keep Spa on the calendar. Um, so it, that's something else that may need to be considered. Yeah, I'm just having, I'm still having a look online. My internet is a little bit slow. So I'm just going through this. I'm just going to say the oval part. I'm sure there is, uh, see, what is the bank called? It's just saying the oval. I'm sure that's not quite what it was. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to have to come back yeah. to that. I don't want another time. Let us know in the comments if you know. That would be a nice little challenge to our YouTube followers if you do know what the original name was for the first bank curve on the old oval layout at monza do let us know what that is i know one of them was parabolica obviously um and yeah. even then they've they've changed that name i can't remember what that's called now i always look at that as parabolica but you're right the point is is that we see iconic corners of the past and for safety reasons they have been reprofiled and they'll always be remembered for what they were, you know, the positive element of it as well. Of course, they will be held up in some level of infamy because of how dangerous they are. But it doesn't make the circuits less magnific magnificent after that. And at the end of the day, it, it will also guarantee, hopefully, that the future of an iconic venue, an iconic circuit remains on the calendar because there is a great amount of difficulty, I'd imagine, at trying to justify continuing to have races at that circuit whilst that particular section remains. And as much as we might enjoy the excitement of it, I don't think any level of excitement and enthusiasm and, and love or heritage or prestige or whatever you want to call it can supersede the value of life. And every time a life is lost it's always a horrible thing no circuit is worth that that's why they stopped racing at the Norse life and unless something happens dramatically to make things better I could easily see a scenario where we stop going to spa for the same reason it's always been on the cusp of going off the calendar in normal circumstances when we're not even talking about fatalities or, or dangerous racing or anything like that so you know as I said 
We'll have to wait and see. But let us know your thoughts in the comments, guys. Should Spa still be on the F1 calendar if they don't make significant changes to the Eau Rouge and Radion section? Uh, the next topic of discussion, Lee, I wanted to run by you, was an interesting piece on the engine equalization. Now, for those of you who you know aren't aware of what's been going on, there's been some stories going through the paddock about the desire for the FIA and F1 to introduce engine equalization measures with the ambition of making sure all of the engine manufacturers are able to produce the same level of power to their cars throughout the race weekend. Now, as as it stands right now, we're in a engine homologation period, which basically means that the engine manufacturers, Ferrari, Red Bull powertrains, slash Honda, whatever you want to call it, uh, Ford as well, I suppose, uh, Mercedes and Renault, who, su- who supply Alpine, they cannot make improvements to their engine for the basis of improving power or electrical energy. They can only make changes based on reliability. Now, some of you will obviously come at me and say, well, you know, they always um, make improvements based on reliability and durability, but obviously that's going to come with a power increase as well. Now, I understand that, but the FIA obviously held the stance that unless... And if it, if it happens that way, that's fine. But obviously, that shouldn't be the aim. So as far as we're aware, um, none of the manufacturers are trying to improve their engines for performance. It's only for reliability only. And as it stands right now, Otmar Jaffna, the Alpine team principal, has gone on record in saying that he would support the engine equalization program as at the moment, Alpine are currently running 35 to 40 brake horsepower down on its competitors. Now, you guys might think 35 to 40 brake horsepower doesn't sound like a lot when these cars are churning out over a thousand brake horsepower at the moment, but it really does make a difference. It's at least a couple of attempts a second or lap or somewhere in that region. And I'm not an engine expert. So, you know, the fact that I'm saying that, perhaps an engine expert would probably say, well, it's probably not that much, but it is still going to be some level of margin that Alpine are struggling with at this point in time. Christian Horner has even come out in support of this and he feels that if there is a bit of a parity because of this homologation period, then it only seems fair for all the manufacturers to be able to run all the cars at the same power output all the time. So there's no unfair advantage, if you like. So Lee, I want to get your thoughts on this. As it stands right now, Alpine are claiming they're running 35 to 40 brake horsepower down or with the Renault engines compared to its competitors. Should the FIA and F1 introduce an equalization measure to make sure that that deficit is removed and Alpine can at least fight on equal footing, pardon the pun, uh, and just worry about the aero? Uh, I believe it's a a a fair thing to do. In the past, um, I can't remember the period, and I think it was Renault again at the time, um, the the V8 um, era, there was an engine equalization because the Renault engine was down, if I recall. I could be completely wrong, I'm making this up. Um, so I do apologize if <laughs> that's the case, but I'm sure that was the case. There was an um, engine equalization at the time. Um, and I think it's a fair thing to do when you've got homologated engines. Yeah, and it's obviously an unfair advantage. It's not uh, what's outside the spirit of the rules is a, a common phrase that's thrown up. So I think it's fair and perfectly reason. Obviously, there's a lot be a lot of pushback from the manufacturer that will have the engine advantage, even if it's over the other teams, not just Renault, there's the manufacturer, because even a five or 10 horsepower is not a lot, but it's still an advantage that the other manufacturers don't have. So I'm sure this debate is not over yet and probably wrangle on for several more months before they even decide to say yes or no to this. I mean, this is what I love about Formula One, because as I said, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you a crankshaft from a piston if they're not the same thing. I don't know. They're probably not. Um, so I am certainly not the guy to talk to when it comes to about understanding these engines, considering how complex that they are. That being said, it just it boggles the mind how they can actually implement an engine equalization uh, method. I mean, do they do they try and work out a, a level of fuel injection which relates to the power output? Do they restrict the battery uses to try and level things out? I, I don't know. Any engine experts out there, do let me know. I'd, I'd love, honestly, I would love to 
talk to someone that knows a thing or two about these engines and actually explain to me in, in a decent level of detail how that would actually work. You know, I'd be quite fascinated to learn about that. That being said, um, I I mean, I'm, I'm always in the interest of trying to level the playing field in that regard. I was a bit intrigued by Christian Horner's support for this and also not surprised and, I, and I'm going to be a little cynical here so Red Bull fans forgive me I'm not trying to throw shade at Christian here but I think the fact that Christian Horner has come out and supported this suggests to me that this is an opportunity for him to try and peg back his immediate rivals at Ferrari and possibly even Mercedes because at this point of time it's wildly believed I say wildly it, it's believed by a lot of people that Ferrari currently have the most powerful uh, engine or power unit you know their their power unit combining the electrical energy and the internal combustion engine produces more uh, brake horsepower than any of the others it's also reported that Mercedes aren't that far behind them with potentially whether you want to call it Honda or Red Bull powertrain slash Ford whatever you want to call it they are just behind them or in that ballpark as well so any opportunity I suppose for Christian Horner to peg their rivals back and give Red Bull an even larger advantage, he's certainly going to go for. Um, that's just me being cynical, but I do understand Otmar Jaffner's situation at Alpine. Obviously, if they're lacking that much power to the others, then they're obviously going to want to make sure they can try and close that gap up. Yeah, especially when they've just been recently leapfrogged by McLaren and the constructors and they feel, oh, we're only a few tenths behind. If we had equal engines, we could be fighting McLaren for being in the top 10 instead of being outside of the top 10. And it, obviously that makes a difference of millions of um, euros a, a year. So it's uh, all to count for. I mean, where do Alpine even go right now? Because this was a team that targeted P4 at the start of the season. And then things went away a little bit. Nobody expected Aston Martin to make the jump they did, but they did. And then Miami, Lauren Rossi came out and gave the scathing review of his team. He's now gone on top of all of that, he didn't want to lower the expectations when Alpine had a good weekend at Miami, thinking, no, no, we can get P4. And then there were questions saying, could they catch Ferrari? McLaren have come out of nowhere. And now people were saying McLaren could even finish P2 in the Constructors' Championship. The way they're going, I probably wouldn't rule it out. I think P3 is certainly a lot more likely. But it just leaves Alpine in a position where they're miles off those ahead of them, but they're comfortably ahead of those behind them. So it's almost like what do you do right now if you're Alpine? I suppose you've got to try and find any sort of advantage you can get or find ways to peg your opposition back to try and make your weekends a little bit better. Yeah, uh, right. Well, it's the classic Alpine land. It's just fallen down the uh, the grid order a bit. But the also the other pit is actually to find out where they're lacking speed in the car and obviously it, do a McLaren or Aston Martin next year and use their demoted position in the constructors to have a strong season next year with the extra resource um, time there there be allotted well that's certainly the theory I suppose we'll have to see but uh, yeah interesting topic to talk about I, as I said I don't know if this is actually going to go through it's just being discussed at this point in time I'm sure we'll hear more about it this weekend in the coverage but uh, we'll wait and see and of course this is a circuit where Straight line speed and a good engine is obviously going to be important. So if we start seeing Alpine getting overtaken by, let's say, Alex Albon or Slogan Sargent, for example, or even the Hasses, then I'm sure the topic is certainly going to go up, uh, come up this weekend uh, in a bit more detail, maybe a few more voices behind it as well. So moving on to the next point of discussion. Um, McLaren, we talked about McLaren, and I want to talk about them in a bit more detail, and Aston Martin as well. So we've got... McLaren, who are shooting up the ranks right now, we already said that I personally think they could end up P3 by the end of the season. I, don't, I certainly think Ferrari are not safe at all. Aston Martin are dropping quite dramatically. But McLaren have now become the team that Aston Martin were. You know, Aston Martin started the season arguably with the second best car at most races, or third at the very least. Now they've started to drop down with this development war raging on. And McLaren been like a sleeping giant they went about their process quite methodically in the same way that Aston Martin did last season and now McLaren find themselves in a position where 
they could, in Lando Norris's hands at least, and Oscar Piastri doing a good job as well, more often than not, be fighting for a podium at this point in time. Um, Lee, I want to get your thoughts on that because McLaren were absolutely nowhere at the start of the season. And now, I'm sa- as I'm saying this at the point of recording, they're a lot of people's picks to go on the podium right now behind Red Bull. I mean, can you sort of explain that meteoric rise right now? How, how has that happened? Well, they, at the very start of the season, I think it was around testing or even before testing, McLaren said that their launch car was a pile of rubbish, putting it politely. Um, and it was not their car that they really were aiming to develop for this season um, because they changed their mind so last minute at the end of last season that their development avenue that they were following was not going to lead them to any results. So they just like, eh, this is it. This is our rubbish car. This is what we're going to go with. And we're just going to focus on our new development plan. But because it was so last minute, they didn't get a chance to bring it to the track for several months and they had to develop it and obviously make sure it worked in all their um, scenarios of being the wind tunnel, being CFD. Um, and obviously it produced it. So it started dripping through in Austria and the six months, seven months they've been working on it since the end of last year, it's obviously been fruition. They, they knew what they were doing, where they were inspired by the Red Bull, inspired by the Aston Martin of last season when the Aston Martin obviously brought its, its different uh, Red Bull inspired um, side pods. And it seems to have been uh, the upgrade they were looking for. Absolutely. And Zach Brown apparently is promising more to come later in the season, which will obviously be very interesting to see. But right now, things are looking great for McLaren. So, you know, we turn our attention to Aston Martin right now, who are on the opposite end of this, and they seem to be dropping down. According to their an analysis of the Hungarian Grand Prix, they felt that Fernando and Lance Stroll drove a pretty solid race. And I think looking back on that race, I, I'd probably agree. I think they, they carried out their race pretty well. There weren't any obvious errors or mistakes that I could see on strategy or from the drivers. But ultimately what that meant was they were a long way behind McLaren, who have leapfrogged them, a long way behind Mercedes, and they were still quite a way off a wounded and struggling Ferrari who were tripping over themselves every five minutes. And yet they still finished comfortably ahead of Aston Martin on a circuit that I think Aston Martin were hoping to do well at, or at least compared to Monaco, they certainly were doing. So now they're coming to a position where they're heading into the summer break, currently third in the Constructors' Championship. I think they have the potential to drop down to fifth if they're not careful. And soon, what's the focus going to be with them? Are they going to try and salvage this? Or are they just going to take the lessons that they've learned from watching what McLaren have done and what some of the others have done and perhaps repeat their heroics of last season and try to focus on 2024 and have a proper go at it rather than the one that seems to have fallen away? Well, for for in my opinion, I think the best thing they can do is obviously still develop the car because the rules are pretty stagnant for next year, but just accept that they're going to drop to fifth because obviously it gives them more development time and then try to build that wonder car again for next year. Obviously not stop development completely because as I said, they can still learn lessons for next year but they've lost the development race and once you've lost the development race it's not something like their silver bullet yes mclaren had it but that's an unusual scenario they're not going to find this upgrade that brings them half a second in one upgrade uh, i'm not saying that's what mclaren did and um, brought i can't actually know what how much time their upgrade brought to them i haven't looked that up i mean it's probably uh, a but- second you know, for all our yeah, it's so probably as much of a second. Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, yeah. it, it took a while to put it all together, but it effectively is the closest thing we're going to get to a silver bullet um, this season. So Aston Martin won't be able to reproduce that this late in the season. Um, so you tweak and refine the car, but take the 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 advantage of dropping to fifth in the constructors and just come out guns blazing for next year. They've learned a lesson this year. They learned they had a strong start to the season. And as Corny said in a previous episode, Aston Martin used to be Force India Racing Point, who were teams on the budget. So they've got to learn how to be at the sharp end of the grid. Um, And that takes time. Yes, there's hiring personnel who bring that experience, which they have been doing, but it still takes time to pass that on to the wider team. So it's a learning curve. And obviously, it's all part of uh, Lawrence Stroll's plan. and I would say it's been a successful season um, for them, regardless if they finish fifth or not. 
Yeah, I mean, we are calling this quite early, you know. Yeah. The summer break. If we did the season review a couple of weeks ago, the half season review a couple of weeks ago, obviously there'd be nothing but glowing praise for Aston Martin. There still will be praise for them. You know, we shouldn't forget in the first, what was it, first six races, Fernando Alonso was on the podium five times and P4 in the other one. So, you know, I, I don't think you can look at the first half of their season and focus too much on the negatives. That being said, I think the picture at this point in time is starting to get, is going to get bleaker and bleaker. I don't think we're going to get to a point where Aston Martin will drop down to P6 or P7 overall like they did last season. I am pretty confident that even if they didn't do much for the rest of the season, the very worst is going to be P5 for them. So, you know, it's still a decent car. They're still picking up points week in, week out with both their drivers. I don't think that's too much of an issue. But at the same time, I think questions need to be asked about where they go from here. If you were in that position, Lee, you, um, you know, you've got the job at Aston Martin now. Mike Crack, Martin Whitmarsh and Lawrence Stroll, more importantly, all now listen on what you would do. What would you do if you were the TP at Aston Martin? Ooh. Well, I'll go and speak to Fernando Alonso. <laughs> okay, you, you bring <laughs> Fernando Alonso in the meeting. You ask him, right, Fernando, what is El Plan? What is El Plan Verde for 2024? Oh, I think they're, they're as I said, it's the, the right, the, I don't think they'll fall lower than fifth. But I think the target would be to really try and sneak for fourth. And I think that's more of a fight with Ferrari um, more than another any other team. Um, so maybe that focus on that and that keep um, closing the gap to Ferrari and the constructors because I think a resurgent McLaren is going to storm past the both of them. Um, but yes, yeah, next year is I think should be their key factor and salvage well, any best results they can get for the rest of the year and obviously not give up and switch off. That's the worst thing they can do. Um, but I, I do think it's a focus on Ferrari uh, as their main rival right now. Uh, and look from there. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, I mean, the way the way you got to look at it as well with the ATR regs that with Aston Martin currently P3 in the Constructors' Championship, they are going to lose time on development yeah. than they would compared to the first half of this season because of the, the, the rise, I think it was, what, what, three places higher than they were uh, at the end of last season, finishing, well, no, four places actually because they were cool. P7, weren't they? So... You know, they are going to lose that to a certain degree, but they will have more time if they fall down the order and focus on 2024. They will have more time in the first uh, in, in the next ATR period that follows afterwards. And this is assuming that they come fifth in the Constructors' Championship at the end of this season. So there are positives there. And for me, the test will be, can they replicate what they did at the first half of last season with less seemingly less resource available to them that being said of course there are going to be lessons learned there and there will be some things like the wind tunnel and the simulator going online quite late is it this year or next year something like that so you know that there is room for this to work in this long-term plan and I think we have to remember it's a long-term plan I don't think many people expected Aston Martin to be challenging for podiums or even the odd race win if it wasn't for Red Bull they would have had a few wins by now and I don't think many of, many of us expected that to happen so soon. That being said, it's a really good platform for them going forward. As long as they remain patient and they don't beat themselves up too much because they've got to remember who they're competing against here. You know, take McLaren out of it because McLaren, but McLaren have, you know, have always been a very good team. It's been a case of they just got to get it all together and be honest with themselves and they'll be fine. And I think that's what we're seeing with McLaren now. It's took a while for them to get there, but they're there now. And you've got Mercedes, Ferrari, and Red Bull. And all the jokes about Ferrari in this equation, they fit in with the other two in this regard. They are established dynasties in Formula One that, even in a cost cap era, are still going to have the best facilities. They're still going to have the best people to a degree. They're still going to have the most resource to a certain extent. So that's what Aston Martin needs to catch everyone else up on. And they are getting there. But in the meantime, I think they just have to be a bit patient, learn the lessons, take the wins when they come. And, you know, there have been plenty of things to be positive about this season so far and not draw too much on the negatives. If they can do that, I think the next few years we're going to see this evolution of Aston Martin take different 
shapes and forms and get progressively better. And if they're already knocking at the door of those big teams already, you can only imagine how good they're going to be in a few years' time. The question, of course, will be, will Fernando Alonso still be driving for them at that time? Oh, also, I think the other, you can also raise a question about the other driver in the team of uh, Lance Stroll. Um, yes, it's the father, but as we've alluded before, there's a lot of pressure starting to build up on Lance because he's not delivering the results that Fernando was or even being close. And you can't fight for championship if your other driver isn't there as close as the other driver. I mean, I'm not, there obviously are no drivers. Teams don't want their drivers to be fighting on the track, but that's really what they want them to be. They want to be on the closest possible to each other, not to be um, disparity in between the driver's points, which there is currently between Fernando and uh, Lance. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I'm, I don't want to say I'm surprised because I, I kind of am and I'm not at the same time. I don't think we've seen a more harmonious relationship between two drivers in a team than these two this season. And maybe it's a bit forced, and people can put whatever agenda or whatever bonus in Fernando's contract to be nice to Lance and give him some driver coaching tips all they want. But it is an element that has taken me a bit by surprise that Fernando has come into this team and almost whilst being Fernando, also being very un-Fernando and supportive to his teammate. You know, he's always wanted to wrestle dominance, but I think it just shows how unique this situation is that he is racing alongside a teammate who he knows he's going to beat all ends up everywhere that they go on a normal weekend. But he's also aware of the fact that he's racing the boss's son. And maybe Fernando's buying himself time here. You know, obviously, as long as he drives to a high standard, Lawrence is going to want him in that car. But obviously, in the meantime, whilst the evolution is taking shape and it will take time for it to, you know, finally show the final version of it where they can fight for race wins in a world championship he's still got to make sure he's in that seat and not ruffling too many feathers because I'm sure there are plenty of other drivers up right now not in one of those big seats thinking I might just play my cards right and wait and maybe that Aston Martin seat might be mine when they're in a position to win races and world championships oh yeah I'm sure it's cool there especially a bit early in the season but have caught attention from other drivers looking for their chance and and obviously Aston Martin had their own plans. So I'm definitely sure it's going to be a hot seat in future seasons. Yeah, interesting stuff. But let's know your thoughts, guys. Get in the comment section. Let's talk about Aston Martin. What should they do if you were the team principal? Should they focus on 2024? Continue this evolution at the moment of becoming a big powerhouse in F1? Or should they try and develop the car and put resource in to try and see if they can get back in the fight for P2 in the Constructors' Championship. As I said, they're not they're not a long way off. You know, we're, we're talking about them as if they're like Mercedes compared to Red Bull, and it's like 250 points or something crazy like that. Um, you know, right now, it's only about, was it 39 points between Mercedes and Aston Martin? It's a lot. Don't get me wrong. It's a lot. But it's not impossible for that to be reeled in if Aston Martin find a green or silver bullet like McLaren have, and all of a sudden they're on it again. You just don't know. That's how Formula 1 has been this season, at least outside uh, the top team at this point in time. So let us know your thoughts in the comments. Let's get on with the predictions element of this episode, Lee. Now, for those of you that are new to the DNF1 F1 podcast, by the way, subscribe and leave us a five-star review on your favourite pod platform if you can. It really helps us out a lot. But in these episodes, we have a set list of predictions that we like to give for the race weekend. And we try and do our best to see how many of these will actually get right, as hard as it may seem. Um, we are keeping score of this. And I know a lot of you have been asking me, Ad, like, what's the score update? Who, who's actually doing what? In the summer break, I think what we'll do, I'm going to tally these up. And when we get to the Dutch Grand Prix, when we're back from the summer break, I think we'll do a bit of a sit wrap and see how we're doing on these predictions because uh, I couldn't tell you off memory how things are right now. I know I'm pretty shoddy at the moment. My predictions have been dreadful. So I'm starting to doubt my wheel knowledge on this one. But the first category on this one, best surprise. This is for the driver or the team that we think are going to give us the best positive surprise this weekend. Bit of a dark horse, if you like. So Lee... Who's going to be the best surprise at the Belgium Grand Prix this weekend? Uh, my best surprise, I think, will be Alex Albon. Ooh, I like that. Why is Alex um, Albon going to be the best surprise? I think, well, we know that Williams is really good in a straight line. And obviously there are 
some nice ample strong parts of this circuit. They may not be too great around the other parts of the circuit and the high speed and the low speed parts. But um, I believe Alex will get into the, the top 10 and uh, have a really strong result for Williams this weekend. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you on that one, mate. Uh, I'm going to go with Alex Albon as well. I was thinking about him and, do you know, it, it's funny because at Hungary, I think Williams were not in their element. It was a circuit that they were going to struggle at. And Alex still nearly got in the points. What was it, P11 overall? Yeah. And, and don't forget, it's a sprint weekend as well. So, you know, there is going to be an opportunity for him maybe to try and go for broke there. Maybe not so much get points in the sprint race, but, you know, we'll have to wait and see how that goes for him. But I think in the main race, I think Alex is going to be very, very strong. You know, we talked about the overtaking opportunities going down the Camel Strait and, you know, the final sector as well, that Williams is going to be very, very quick. If they can get the balance right with the middle sector and put the downforce on the car where they can, he could have a very strong weekend. And I think... Alex in particular, you know, I'd, I'd love to focus more on his story at the moment, but I think he's really putting himself in the frame for a big seat in the future. May not necessarily be at Red Bull. I even heard rumours the other day that Ferrari were even considering yeah. him as potential replacement for signs in the future if signs goes elsewhere in a couple of years' time. So the big teams are taking notice of Alex Albon's form at the moment. I mean, he's definitely... Uh doing his um, best to fill George Russell's shoes at Williams and, and obviously putting his own uh, label on it as well. But yeah, he's doing brilliantly and completely out driving and out delivering his teammate at the moment. Mm, absolutely. Um, I mean, look, we, we can try and compare, you know, stints between Russell and Albon. And I'm sure a lot of people will say, well, you know, I think Albon has probably proven that Russell's performances weren't as impressive as they may seem. I think to that, I would say that... Russell's situation at Williams was a lot more dire than Alex Albon's by comparison. And I'm not suggesting that Russell did a better job. But what I am suggesting is this Williams is a lot more consistently competitive than it used to be. So, you know, the peaks and troughs of what Russell was able to achieve versus what Alex is able to achieve, I don't think can really compare it fairly. But I think what it does show is that Alex Albon is doing a remarkable job in a car that is good, but... You know, he's on the fringes of points every weekend, if not well in the points. So, you know, it just goes to show how good of a job he is doing right now in a team that is making good progress. So, yeah, I absolutely agree. On a separate note, I almost forgot about this. A sprint weekend at Spa. How have we got an F1 sprint weekend at Spa? I mean, that's going to be like three laps long, isn't it, Lee? Yeah, it must be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what the distance for the sprint maybe maybe get a full flat, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think and just trying to do the maths in my head. What would it be like? Like 14 laps, 14, 15 laps around Spa? It's like a third race distance, so it'd be about 15 laps or something like that. Yeah, really not going to be uh, that many laps, but it means they won't have time for the field to spread out, um, which does happen quite a lot at Spa because obviously it's a big circuit, so mm. it could be really interesting. Me, I don't know what the weather forecast for this weekend is. To it's going to be out. rainy this weekend. Oh, even better. There we go. It's a safety car Yeah. Uh, on the sprint race. Yeah. No, it's, uh, apparently it's meant to be raining on Friday and Saturday. And then on the Sunday, it's going to be dry, I think. But that being said, it, it's Spa. They have their own, like Courtney keeps saying, his favorite word on this show, microclimate. Uh, they have that there, don't they? So, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, Weather Watch is going to be interesting this weekend, so we we'll have to watch out for that. Next category, the flop of the weekend. So we were glowing in our reference of Alex Albon. Flop of the weekend. I am going to go with K-Mag. I think it's going to be a tough weekend for Haas. It's been a tough period for them for a while. That being said, you know... We, a lot of people have been praising Nico Hulkenberg, but I would argue that his race stints aren't as impressive as K-Mag's. You know, he's just got the edge on K-Mag in qualifying this season. But when you look at the race in isolation, K-Mag's actually doing a pretty decent job. And, and more often than not, he's actually beaten Hulkenberg. So I feel like there needs to be a bit of context there. Even though I'm defending K-Mag, I still think he's going to flop this weekend. And I hate myself for thinking that, unfortunately. But there you go. Uh, poor Kevin. That's, uh, that's not very nice. Prove me wrong, k Mag. Prove <laughs> me wrong. I believe in you. Just not right now for this podcast. 
Well, yeah, he's he's been a bit terrible, but yeah, I do agree. I think he's had better race results than Nico. The problem with Nico, Nico qualifies brilliantly and then goes backwards. That's it. But I think that's more that's more um, intrinsic to the Haas right now, where it's yeah. a good car in qualifying in ideal conditions with soft tyres and low fuel and everything else, just like the Ferrari, but then it drops away in the race more emphatically than anybody else does. The difference between them and Ferrari, of course, is that Ferrari can go through whatever development direction they want, Haas kind of have to wait and see what Ferrari does and then hope it works, really, because they can't really do their own thing because of, you know, the listed parts and the technical knowledge and all that stuff they have with Ferrari. It's 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 a bit of a um, bit of a tease for them, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, maybe that's a, a further question that they have to ask themselves if the popularity of Formula One and their income, do they need to uh, reduce the amount of listed parts? But that's... Uh... That's up to them. Well, they just built that base over at Marinello. So uh, yeah. this was not in the feasibility study. Like what, you know, I I feel for them. I, I do. But I think this is where you go. This is where Formula One is going. It's trying to move away from that. Um, and hopefully, Hus, as you said, are in a position where they generate enough revenue now where they could, probably could go it alone. But I suppose we'll have to wait and see how that works out for them. Um, anyway, look, we're getting off tangent. Yeah. Who is going to be your flop of the weekend, Lee? My flop of the weekend is Alpine. Um, I don't expect another double DNF. I'm not staying as the flop. I just think there's going to be a lot of internal pressure itself imposed on the team uh, regarding how the last few races have gone. Obviously, they're changing management, uh, senior management. Um, and I think they, as a team, they're going to overdrive. They're going to overperform in a negative way. And it's going to give them, they're going to have a really bad weekend. Yeah, I I I can't really say I disagree with Alpine. They deserve to have a good weekend. It's been due. I suppose what surprised me about Alpine this season is that there's been a few times where Ocon and Gasly have collided with each other. Obviously, had the incident in Australia, which was very much brushed off. Um, obviously, in Hungary, it wasn't really their fault. But there has been um, the anticipation that it was all going to flare up between the two drivers. But by and large, it hasn't really happened, quite frankly. I don't know if I'm happy about that or disappointed for the dra- for the lack of drama well they haven't had uh, that many good race weekends that they've actually been close to each other on the circuit for the drama to occur so it just makes melbourne all the more <laughs> relevant then for that reason because like that was the one weekend we were on it and we threw it away but nobody seems to be drawn on that maybe when we watch drive to survive for this season they'll focus primarily on that and that will um re-engage everybody's memories or refresh everyone's memories on that and maybe Gasly and Ocon will have something to say in retrospect perhaps maybe yeah well I'm sure as we know Netflix like to um, create stories exaggerate stories I should say more than create stories um so yeah maybe they'll uh, Australia especially will be very juicy for Alpine yeah we're fishing at this point but uh <laughs> You know, what What can you do? You've got to look for narratives this season. You're going to yeah. find them no matter how hard you look for them. So next category. Uh, well, so we're not going to do the sprint poll. I think we're just going to keep it simple and just do the sprint winner for this particular segment. Lee, who's going to be your sprint winner this weekend? Max Verstappen. Max Verstappen, yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, I thought perhaps one of us might be a little bit bold because... We all keep going for Max Verstappen. Last week, was it Tom Bellingham from Matt and Tom P1? Uh, Tom Bellingham, the Max Verstappen fan, went for Lewis Hamilton to get on pole position, and he did. And everybody was like, oh, wow, maybe we should be a bit more bold with these predictions. But uh, I think in race trim, you know, despite the possibility and potential for Red Bull to be beat by someone in qualifying, I don't think you can look past Max or Red Bull in a race format. It's just a completely different league right now. Well, I think Total Wolf said it was like F1 versus F2. Yeah, Max is on such a high as we've been saying. It's uh, barring reliability or other circumstances, very unlikely on his current performance. Mm, absolutely. And I think Hungary was a very cruel but important reminder to a lot of F1 fans that whilst we got massively excited over the prospect of Hamilton and Verstappen fighting and maybe even a new winner coming about, the fact that it was over so quickly and Max was cruising to a half a minute victory just reminded everybody that you know we might think they're making gains on red bull but the reality is that they're not and unless something fundamentally changes i think that's going to be the picture for the rest of the season at this point in time hope to be wrong of course but uh 
yeah, it, it was quite emphatic, that performance. Well, I think it was the biggest uh, victory margin of the season. Mm. They took they took the handbrake off. They let Max use fourth gear. Um, I said, go on, you can have some fun now. So, that, okay. Next category, pole position for the main race. Of course, the sprint weekends don't determine the grid for the main race on Sunday. So, pole position, Lee, is there a chance that we might get someone else on pole other than Max Verstappen this weekend? We did last time. So... I'm actually going to use my bowl prediction on this one, so I'd do it's two in one. Ooh, um, I like it. Lando Norris for pole. Oh, do you know what? I love that. I want to copy you. I do, but I'm not because I, I. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I'm not because I don't want to be copying. I, I'm because that made me change my mind. That I didn't consider that. So, uh, oh, that would be pretty cool if that went through. Um, I guess track limits probably ruin it for us if Lando puts it on pole like uh, yeah, he nearly did before. Um, has Lando been on pole before? Was was it Russia a couple of years ago? Did he put it on pole? Was yeah. that Carlos Sainz? I'm sure it was. Uh, I can't Russia remember. Put on pole. I can, I remember that. I, I remember the race so well, but for some reason I remember it as if Lando was on pole. I might be right on that one. I don't know, but uh, yeah, for some reason I always remember that race as Lando being on pole, whether he was or not. I can't remember, of course. Of, you know, of course, it was Hamilton's 100th victory, so uh, very significant in its own right. Pole position. I, I'm gonna go with Charles Leclerc because why not? I can't think of any other good reason. I mean, it's a circuit that he has fond memories of. It was his first victory in Formula One. He still got it in qualifying. The Ferrari still decent. I think Hungary was Hungary was always going to be a tough track for them under certain circumstances, and perhaps they underperformed in qualifying there. But it's still a good qualifying car when they put it all together. Um, if it rains, that completely throws my prediction out the window altogether. But I'm just going to hope for the best conditions. And you never know. Maybe Charles Leclerc will pull another rabbit out of the hat there. Race winner. Do we even need Max, to do this Max one? <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. We should take sorry, this Sorry, Lando. <laughs> Sorry, Lando. Yeah, Max Verstappen. I, I, I don't think there's a case to be argued here. I think the question's going to come where we start to ask ourselves, can they really win every race this season? Can Max win every race remaining this season? Um, we'll see. We'll see. But Max Verstappen all the way to win this weekend once again. The podium. This is where it gets a bit fun. So who's coming second and third after Max Lee? Uh, for me, I've got Lando and Lewis. I like it. I like it. I am going to copy you. Um, I guess we've got to ask, no Checo for the podium? Why no, no. Checo? Uh, well, obviously, in my mind, Lando is going to get pole, but Max is obviously going to blast past him and uh, Lando is going to be good enough to hold on to P2. I do think the Mercedes will be rapid this weekend. Um, and I think, unfortunately, Sergio is not as close to Max and there's going to be drivers in between. Um, Max and Sergio when they on the quali- on the grid. Um, I just believe that Lewis will be able to maintain an advantage ahead of Sergio by the time Sergio's cleared up to P4. Yeah, that's probably true. Do you know what? I'm going to change mine whilst I've got the opportunity to. Um, I'm going to put Perez on the podium. I'm going to put Perez P2 and Lando P3. And, and the reason is, I, I just think, you know, I was impressed by Checo's drive in Hungary. It was a good, as Martin Brundle said, it was a statement drive. I'm not going to go over the hill and say, oh my God, it was a drive of the day performance because drive of the day is always a bit funny because in isolation, drive of the day is exactly what it is. It's the best drive on a Sunday. But then the usual caveats come in, you know, the car that they would drive in, the circumstances that they're in, should they be rewarded for that? Do we need to look into that? At the end of the day, it's a public vote as well. So, you know, you, you do get people voting for drivers they want to vote for regardless whether i'm sure there are people out there that probably voted for pierre gasly to be driver of the day because they like pierre gasly even though he didn't get past the first corner not you know not his own doing but that's just how it goes with these votes um but, but the interesting thing i saw the other day on checo i saw an image on the f1 social media page and it was a picture of sergio perez on the podium from hungary and it was showing that he'd gained 40 positions in the last five races now that's obviously impressive. You know, not many not many drivers make 40 overtakes in a season. You know, Max Verstappen certainly won't, unless he, unless he decides to start at the back of the grid again like he did at Jeddah. Um, 
it'd be interesting to see if he even makes that many overtakes this year. Point being is, given this, the car that Checo has, should we be impressed that he's made four that he's gained forty positions in the last five races, or do we look at this and say, well, in theory, how many of those races have he finished second in? And off memory, I can say. Has he finished second in any of them? Did he finish second in Spain? I don't think he did. I don't no, he didn't actually. He finished, didn't even finish on the podium that race. If I remember right, I think the two Mercs did. So, yeah, looking at all that there, he hasn't finished second in either of them as far as I remember. And on top of all of that, should he need to gain 40 positions? He should be up there with his teammate who's winning races by half a minute at the moment. Um, I mean, on a singular drive of any of those five races... He's done some good driving on the Sunday. I'm not going to take that away from Sergio, but I do think in the wider picture, I don't think he's doing a good enough job. You look at other periods of domination in the sport and the, the drivers have been, when they have the best car and they're dominating the field, they unless there's reliability or it's an accident, they've been at the front of the field. Um, more often or not, you, you obviously... Uh, Senna and Prost, there are going to be similar parts of the track. Um, Schumacher and Barrichello, similar parts of the track. Uh, Lewis and um, Nico, Lewis and Bottas, uh, Sebastian and Mark, they're all on the similar parts of the track. And Sergio is nowhere near uh, Max. And even in, right, I say similar parts of the track, I mean P1, P2, P3, in the, in the podium range. Sergio is not getting there. And I, yes, he's got P2 in the constructors. But that's more down to get a strong start to the season. And I I don't think he's doing good enough to be delivering on the car's actual performance at the moment. Obviously, from Rebel's perspective, if he secures P2, they'd be happy. But he's not making it easy. Yeah, I mean, it, it's fine to praise him for the recovery drives that he's putting in. But then yep. you have to factor in the fact that the car he's driving in race conditions, as we're seeing from Max, is so much faster than anybody else. And sometimes you don't even see that advantage coming from his car. Like, it's something Max is doing with that as well. He's able to extract that. Now, obviously, I'm not expecting Checo to be on par with Max Verstappen at every single race this season, or even most of them. But if he's about 10, 15 seconds every race slower than Max, chances are he's finished in second at most of them. And even though he's second in the championship, I, I do think that is a relevant point. I, I think it's fine to praise him for it, but context is key here and you know if someone's making 40 overtakes or you know gaining 40 positions and they're starting in a qualifying position that they were expected to then fantastic but in any of those races as Checo started where we thought he would be or where he should be hasn't even finished what probably where he should be either as I said I don't think he's finished second in any of those races and then there goes me thinking he's going to come second this weekend so you know what do I know quite frankly I've just kind of contradicted myself haven't I well, knowing you're like Adam, you actually will come second. Yeah, that's it. This is it. I'm playing the reverse jinx here. I'm doing the reverse of Rosberg right now. And uh, I'm not taking garage selfies. I'd love to be in a position where I probably could take garage selfies. And, uh, you know, we can talk about the Burns jinx rather than the Rosberg one. But uh, we'll, we'll see. We will see. Best of the rest. Now, for argument's sake, because of McLaren's surge up the field, I'm excluding them from this now oh what that goes my <laughs> no because that's that's just too easily we can't we can't we can't you know that's just a slam dunk this point it's almost like at this point I'm, I'm almost thinking about chalking off the race winner category because it's always max like it's like a free point if you want it but um no best of the rest for argument's sake basically nobody in a ferrari mercedes aston martin red bull or mclaren now we've got to go alpine downwards now so, so the top five top five in the constructors basically pretty much well i mean it, it is fitting you know like the rest of them if you like yeah or okay uh do you have one for this no just just, just oh well, do you i have one it from what i originally I, thought of all right I, i'll go first on this one i i'm gonna go albon no actually no i'm not no i'm not no i'm not i'm gonna go ricardo because that's part of my bold prediction um which is points for ricardo so the natural order of things likely will be that Ricardo will have to be the best of the rest to get points. That's how it's been this season. Um, for me, then, Alex Albon it will be my best of the rest. Ah, there you go. See, we change things on the fly. We don't even plan for it. It throws everything into chaos. Bold prediction. Um, 
I don't rem- recall you giving your bowl prediction. Did you leave? Lando Pole. Lando Pole prediction. All oh, right, you did. Oh, well, there you go. Lando Pole position for you, and for me, Ricardo in the points. And I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful Danny Rick gets in the points. Um, you know, we were very much praising his performance at Hungary. And, you know, there was concern about Sonoda. I think we have to put context on this with Sonoda because he damaged the front wing, what was it, on Saturday? And yeah. it was a new front wing, an upgraded one. And that was worth about a tenth and a half a lap, which is kind of the delta in ultimate pace between the two. But after that, Ricardo was in a completely different league to his teammate, quite frankly. And I think the the 400 IQ play on strategy when he did, what was it, an 11-lap stint on the hards, and then I think he had to go on to the mediums afterwards because he pitted early when he caught up traffic to try and undercut everyone. Went in the pits again and did a 39-lap stint on the mediums to undercut everybody again. And he absolutely nailed it and brought it home on a circuit that was really, really tough on rear tyres. And he did a great job. And it was great to see Ricardo looking like his former self again. Yeah, he just needed a shoey on the podium, really. To uh... I feel like because of the car he's in, he's not going to get on the podium unless something ridiculous happens. Oh, yeah. There should just be a reserved spot where he gets to come up after a good race and just do a shoey just for the vibes more than anything else. Yeah. Everyone. Just make him a special spot on the podium, the Daniel Rick uh, podium. There you go. Like, come off and do a it'd be, like a, it'd be like a little throne. You've got the shoeys there. You can take, it doesn't even have to be a, a used one. It can just be a fresh shoe, a spare one. I'm sure they have spares. Just, you know, he has the alcohol of his choice, if you like. Obviously, you know, won't be obliged to name it on the broadcast because they already have an alcoholic sponsor, uh, if memory serves. So, you know, go nuts. Have one of those. Part of the atmosphere, part of the weekend. And uh, life is so much better when you see Daniel Ricciardo having a shoey on the podium. So I think it should just be a regular thing in F1 now. I think uh, he will go for that one. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm sure he'd be. F- I'm sure he'd love that. Uh, I certainly would. It's always fun. Um, but I think that's all we've got time for, guys. Let us know your predictions in the comments below. If you're watching this on YouTube, of course. If you're following us on your favourite pod platform, get over to the YouTube channel. Let us know your predictions in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Yes, you listening to this show, going on a walk in the gym, listening on your favourite pod platform. Get to YouTube. Subscribe to the channel. Get in the comments. Want to know your thoughts. Anyway, that's all we got time for on this one. It went on a little bit longer, so do apologize for that. I know the previews are meant to be a bit shorter, but we will be back for the race review this weekend. Hopefully, it's going to be a great race. Hopefully, everybody stays safe. Of course, we can't forget how dangerous the sport can be. Hopefully, everybody's safe this weekend. But until then, thanks for tuning in. As always, please stay safe. And we'll see you in the next episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. And remember, as always, if you're not first, you're probably DNF1. Take care. Goodbye.